Psalm 43, verse 18. Sorry, not Sam. Isaiah, sorry. Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43. Verse 18. It says, Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. He says in verse 19, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall not shall you not know it? will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So this is the Lord saying, Behold, I will do a new thing. The title of the message is The New Beginning. Beginning means a start of a thing. When you say the beginning, it means a start of a thing. New means fresh. New can also mean never be done before. New also can mean not used before, a new thing. So new and begin can be synonyms of one another. So new beginning can mean you start afresh. When you say new beginning can mean you start afresh. New beginning can be in any area you want it to be. New beginning can be in any area you want it to be. It can be in your walk with God. It can be in your walk for God. But also, it can mean new beginning in your career, new beginning in your studies, new beginning in your health. It can mean new beginning in your marriage. It can mean new beginning for your family. It can mean new beginning for your children, those of you who have children. So it can be new beginning for different areas of your life. And as we go into this year, which is a new year, you can decide that it's a new year. So it's going to be a new beginning in this area of my life or in all of these areas of my life. There's a story of, some of us might have heard the story of a mad, of mad people. The day a madman knows that he's mad, it's a new beginning <laughs> for him. Because now, because mad people don't know they're mad. But when they know that they're mad, that is also a new beginning for them. New beginning also is a product of a change. That is, you decide that I want, don't want to do this again. I want to start with something new. So it can be a new beginning or even a product change. It can be a new beginning in the way things are done. You could say this is the way I've always done it, but I don't want to do it again. I want to start a new direction. Or for a completely new direction of anything. Say, I'm going this way before. I don't want to go that way again. I want to go this way. That also can be a new beginning. New beginning also shows that things are... The new beginning also can show that things are going on well now. But I want it to be better. Because better is better than good. And best is better than better. So you can decide that I want things just to be better. So you decide I want to start afresh. When we think about the message of Jesus Christ, his message is repent. John the Baptist came, talked about repent. Jesus Christ come and talked about repent. Repent also means a new beginning. That's what it means, because the message of repent simply means think differently. Start to think differently. Don't think the way you've been thinking. Think differently. And then that's why you find that the message of our Lord Jesus Christ, it kept saying that you have heard, that is, you've been told this. Now I tell you, do this. For example, it says, if somebody slaps you, you have heard that an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That is the old. He says, but now I tell you, don't do that. It changed the way they were thinking. And so new beginning can simply means also you change all that you have believed. All that you have thought about, you change the way you think. And so, it's 
the beauty, and this is the part I like the most, the beauty of new beginning is that you can decide when you want the new beginning to start. What do I mean by that? You are in control of your new beginning. You are in control of your new beginning. Most of the time, we believe that it's God is in control of our new beginning. No, no, no. When we make up our mind, God helps us with it. God has not taken the power from you and me. The ability to make choices. So you choose that. I want a new beginning for my life. And because I want a new beginning, I want a new direction. I want to start afresh. I want to do this one. I want to do that one. Then God now enables you because you have made up your mind and you have made the choice. The good thing about new beginning is that you can decide when you want the new beginning to be. Of course, when we're children, we're still on our parents, the choice is not that much for us. They force us to do a whole lot of things that we don't want to do or we feel that's not what we should do. But once you're an adult and you make decisions for your life, you can say, I am done with this. I want a new life. Even in our relationships, you can tell whether you're dating somebody or something, I don't want to do this again. I want a new beginning with somebody else. I want this. I'm not saying drop your boyfriend or your mates anyhow. That's not what I'm talking about. But you have the power of a choice. You have that power of that new beginning. You can decide to start now. You can decide that your new beginning is going to be six months' time. You have the power to decide when. You have the power to decide when the new beginning will be. So God can say, behold, I will do a new thing. But you can resist it and say, I'm not ready for any new thing. There are times God speaks to us and we reject his counsel. There are times people, God decides that this is what I would like you to, to do. He lays it strongly upon your heart. But man's heart can be hardened and says, yes, God, you've spoken, but that's not what I'm going to do. So the power of new beginning starts with you. And when it normally starts, just like the example I gave up of, of, of the mad person, the day realizes, for us, we are not mad, is the day we are tired of what is going on with us. We can then decide that it's going to be a new beginning. You decide that, you know what, I'm tired of this life. I'm tired of this kind of lifestyle. I want a new beginning. I want to start afresh. And so it's important that we, that we, 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 we know that because we decide when we want our new beginning. And also, let's not always think new beginning means it's a failed life. No. You, just, you might just want it better, like I said earlier on. Your life can be going good. Your career can be going good. Your school can be going good. Everything can be going good. But you just look at the future. And then you say, you know what? I think it's better for me to start afresh. It's a tough thing. It's not an easy thing to make a decision to start afresh. Because a lot of the times, people don't want to start afresh because they think about all they've put in certain area. They think about what they put in the relationship. And so they say, no, I don't want to start afresh. I've put in too much of my emotions. But then you know that this relationship is going in the wrong direction. All the alarm bells, the alarm is on saying, get out of this trade, it's about to crash. But you say, you know, I've invested a lot of time. I've invested a lot of emotion. And what you're supposed to do is to say, I think it's better for me to start afresh. This is going to take me nowhere. So the power of the beginning, you have that power. And of course, there are certain things in life that forces you to have a new beginning. Maybe a major setback can make you have a new beginning. What we say, a wake-up call. That incident was a wake-up call for me. So you can say, you know what? You didn't plan it, but certain things happen, and then you say, I'm done. I've got to start afresh. I've got to go another direction. So we find that situations and circumstances can force us to make us change. Failure also can change our attitude, like I said, for us to decide to turn a new leaf. They will say, I want to turn a new leaf. It also means I want to start afresh. I want a new beginning. But even with that, you will still have you still have the power of new beginning because you could decide 
to still your heart. What I mean by still, S T double E L. That is, you know, when you say you have an iron clad heart, that nothing is going to penetrate it. You can decide to do that. And decide you don't want a new beginning. But for today, the message today is for those of us who want to have a new beginning. That's the message for us. Who decides that, you know what? I need a new leaf. I need to turn a new leaf. I need to go a new direction of our lives. And especially when we look at our lives, we don't like where our lives is. Maybe you're married. You don't like the direction of your life. So, what do you want to do? For those of us who are married, we don't believe in divorce. It's for you and your spouse to sit down and say, the direction we are going to, this thing is going to crash. Why don't you have a new beginning? Why don't we decide to look at what are our challenges? What is the reason for our disagreement? Can we start with a new beginning? Maybe you have a career, and you look at your career, it's not going anywhere. And instead of you just beating a dead horse, maybe you decide, I want a new beginning in my career. Maybe it's your health that is not going on well. And then they tell you, stay away from this, stay away from that. Then you decide that, you know what? I want a new beginning for my health. I want to be stronger. I want to be fitter. And you know, it's interesting that at the beginning of every year, the gym, they are always full. When you go there, you can hardly get packed. Everybody's there. Because one way or the other, the number one thing that post shows us is that the number one decision most people make at the beginning of the year is about their health. Weight. They want to lose weight. They want to do this. But most people are never able to sustain it. So, you get to the gym, there's no parking, just wait for another three months. You find out that people are not going to be there. And I'm guilty of that. Every year, I always said I want to change my one pack into six pack. But I don't have the discipline to do that. So, I go a few times after that, I'm tired. And I know I'm not by myself. There are people sitting here who are guilty of the same thing. And so, it's those who want a new beginning in the different areas of their lives. That's who I'm, I'm here to talk to. Let me tell you there's a first step for a new beginning is the desire. That's the first step. Is the desire that you want a new beginning. That's the first thing. The desire. And let me say this. Maybe the sub before the desire is for you to have a body. Then the burden to turn into a desire. How, what do I mean by the burden? What I mean by the burden is you just feel tired of where you are. You just feel the weight of where you are that you don't like it. And so you make up your mind that I don't like the life I live. I'm living. And I'm not talking about one aspect, maybe different aspects of your life. And it could even be one aspect. That you just say, I don't like the area of my relationship. I don't like the area of my studies. I don't like the area of, 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 uh, of my results. I don't like the results I come out with every year. So I've decided I'm going to do this. I'm on a new beginning. That body becomes a desire. Let me say this. God grants us the desire of our hearts. According to his will. God grants us the desire of our hearts according to his will. He grants us the desire of our hearts according to his will. But the question is, people say, well, I don't know the will of God. There is a general will of God that you can start with. And that general will of God is that I have come to give you life. A life that is more than abundant. I have come to give you life. That's what it tells us in the book of John. It says, I've come to give you life, a life that is more than abundant. What does that mean? A life that is overflowing. I've come to give you life that is overflowing. And then that's why he said, I will anoint your head, your cup will run over. So one thing we know is the will of God, is that we live a life of abundance. So if you don't know anything, he wants us to live a life of abundance. And so when you are not happy with a part of your life, it means you're not living the life that is more than abundant. And so the desire for change tells us that God will help you for the change that you desire. So the first thing 
his desire. Because he grants us that, the desire of our hearts. There's a story in the Bible. It's a story of a leper. In the book of Luke, this is what he said. He went to Jesus Christ and he said, if thou will, I know that you can heal me. He had a desire not to continue to be a leper. That's it. And Jesus Christ said to him, I am willing to be healed. He says, you can heal me. You can cleanse me. And Jesus Christ said, I'm willing for it. So he had that desire. And because of the desire that he had, he went to Jesus for help. He knew he couldn't help himself, but he knew that God could help him. So the desire helped him. Maybe, like I said, maybe before the desire, we can say the burden. The burden of being tired of being a leper. Put the desire to get cleansed inside of you. The burden of maybe he just finds out that he's tired of this kind of life, living in isolation. So the desire to get clean. And so you reach out to the solution, which was with Jesus. There's the woman with the issue of blood also. 12 years, she had had continuous blood drain in his life. And so she reached out to Jesus. She had a desire. Guess what she said also? She said, if only I can touch the hem of the garment, I will be made whole. That's what she said. So she wanted oldness. That starts the new beginning of her life. She was tired of the sickness of 12 years. She, the Bible tells us that she had gone to different doctors. They could not solve her problem. So she was tired. She was burdened. And that burden turned into a desire to go towards Jesus. And so the man who is a leper had a new beginning. What do I mean by that? No matter how much you love your spouse, if your spouse has leprosy, you will not stay on the same bed with that. And so we find out that the man has to live in isolation. And by living in isolation, he desired to be with people. And that's always the first step. A lot of people don't have desire. A lot of people are not bothered because they have not figured out what their life should be. And when you have not figured out what your life should be, there is no impetus, there is no challenge, there is no burden that comes upon you. A pig does not feel burden to leave the field. It's normal for him. It's normal for him. The burden to get cleansed, to live a new life, to have a new beginning, is not for the pig. It's comfortable in the field. But the day he realizes that this is not what I'm supposed to be, then the body starts to say, I don't want the field again. So the first thing is the desire. The desire for a new beginning in any area of your life that is not going on well. The text we're going to use today is found in Nehemiah chapter 1. And I've been sharing with us the theme for the year, like most of us we know, is swearing like an eagle. And of course, we've been talking about the eagle. One of the things we talked about the eagle is that the eagle has what? How many of us remember I shared this a couple of weeks ago? Is that the, the power of what? Vision. One of the things that makes the eagle to stand out is the power of vision. The eagle can see so far away than any other animal, than any other bird. It can swear to the height that no other bird can. And so the, this year, the theme for our church is swearing like an eagle. And so I started talking about two weeks ago about the power of vision that the eagle has. Let's look at this because the number one thing I said is desire. The second thing for new beginning is vision. And that's what I want to talk about. Now. Like I said two weeks ago, there are different explanations I gave about vision. But let me tell you one of the ones I like the most. Vision is the preferred future. Vision is the preferred future. 
The future you prefer for yourself, that is what vision is. The vision that you can say, this is what I would like my life to be in 20 years' time. This is where I would like to see myself in 25 years' time. This is how I would like to see myself when I'm old. That's vision. It is not present to the five senses presently, but you can see it in what we call technicolor. You know, when you go and watch the movie, they say filmed in technicolor. That is in clarity and in all manners of colors. You can see it. You can project it. And then you are driven towards that vision. The Bible says that without the vision, the people perish. I like another translation. It says without the vision, the people run amok, which means they run elter skelter, not knowing what to do. Because the strength of vision is that vision simplifies your life. I've talked about this for a couple of weeks. Vision simplifies your life. It makes you stay away from what you don't need. Because when you have a vision, you know exactly where you're going. When you don't have a vision, every road looks like the road to go. But when you have a vision, you know, it, makes, it affects your totality of your life. Simplifies your life. Vision <laughs> makes you choose a whole lot of things. Make you choose your friends. Make you choose what to wear, what not to wear, what to eat. A lot of things. Vision just changes everything. When you have a vision, you know, like I gave an example of health. When you have a vision, <laughs> Of having a six pack. Nobody needs to tell you what to abstain for and what not to. He tells you, if you're going to do that, he tells you the kind of time you have to spend in the gym. He tells you that you can't continue to drink anything and eat anything and you have six pack. No, you're going to have one like mine. That's all you're going to have. He's not going to have anything like that. And so the truth of the matter is that vision simplifies your life. Because for every area of your life, when you have a vision for it, it changes everything. Those of you are students, if you have a good vision of graduating with good grades, it tells you you can't continue to party the way you are partying and have good grades. You can't continue to do some of the things you are doing and have good grades. You can't continue to smoke, to smoke marijuana and you think you're going to have good grades. No, you're not going to. Because when you smoke marijuana, you are floating most of the time. You know what, it, you know what that means? You are floating, you are high. Amen. Your eyes cannot have focus. Because it becomes blurry, yeah, a lot of thoughts are coming to your head and all of those things. So, if you are focused on graduating and having a degree, vision does one thing, simplifies your life. It lets you know what to take, it lets you know what to avoid, it lets you know also what to embrace. Are you here with me today? <clears throat> are you here with me today? All right, let's look at this story in Nehemiah. We'll read the whole thing. And I want to use it to explain what I've just said. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Akali, it came to pass in the month of Chesley, in the 13th year, that I was in Shushan, the citadel, the palace, that's what I mean, that Anani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who are left from captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates burned with fire. So it was when I heard this word, I want you to see how burden starts and turns into desire and turns into a vision. And this story is a good one. So it was when I heard this word, I sat down and wept and mourned. For many days, I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So when they gave him this news, it was a distressful news. It wasn't the kind of news he wanted to hear. But when he had this, he became burdened with the news that he has had. It was the same thing for each and every one of us. There are news that we hear when our results comes out. That's supposed to be a burden for us when it's not good. Results in anything. Maybe it's your performance in, in your place of work, a performance assessment and all of those things. So what do you do? You just don't cry and mourn. You do something about it. And that's what this man did. The news could be different things. 
It could be a tragic news that you had concerning a family, concerning a friend, or whatever. So this person had this news. And this is what it says. It says, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God. Please, let's say that together. O great and awesome God. But can we say it one more time? That statement is very, very profound. Do you know why? Because he acknowledged the almightiness of God. Awesome, which means that you can do anything. Nothing can you not do. So he acknowledged the sovereignty of God. He talked about how great God is because he knew that what he was about to do, he needed a great God and an awesome God to be able to. And so he acknowledged his greatness. And says, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those you love and observe your commandments. Then he went on, look at the level of his prayer. Then he went on to say something here. He said, go back please. He says this, you who keep your covenant, I don't have time to preach on this, to say so much about this because of my time, but all he said here was that he identified that he had a relationship with God. He identified that he was in covenant relationship with him. Look at his prayer. He says, there is a great and an awesome God. And we have covenant. And it's like you and me when we go to our friends. And then you say, you know what, uh, you know, you're doing very well and all of those things. You know, especially when you need something from them. And you say, you know what, you know, you, know, you and me, we are friends. You know, you establish that relationship. And by the time you say that to the person, you are connecting with that person because of what you want. And that's what he did here. He says, your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. So he was establishing a relationship with God. He has told him how great he is, how awesome he is. And then he went on to continue that. Please let your ear be attentive and your ears opened. A lot of the time, people say, you know, they think, oh, I don't know how to pray. I want you to look and get, when you get to go and look at this guy's prayer. It is not a complex prayer. It is like a dialogue. It is like talking to someone who is a friend. Let me say this to you. The person Jesus introduced to us, he introduced a father to us. He is our God because he created us. He is our Lord because he has authority over us. But the basis of his relationship with you and me is a father and a child relationship. And so you must understand this. And so this guy established this one. And let me say this. This is in the Old Testament. We have a better covenant than Nehemiah. Because the covenant we have is a covenant of our Lord Jesus Christ. The covenant he had is the covenant that comes through the blood of the goats and the bulls. But we have a covenant of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we even have a better covenant. And so when we look at this story, we find out that if it could be effective with that level of covenant, how much more we who have a better covenant? Let's go on. He says, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes opened that you may hear the prayer of your servant which I pray before you now, day and night. That's just simply tell us what? Continuously. Like the Bible says, pray without season. That is, pray without stopping. So, that's what happened here. For the children of Israel, your servant, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. And just like Jesus Christ told us, taught us, forgive us our sins. And so, he knew that sin can stand before us and God. He says, if you regard iniquity in your heart, I will not hear you. And so he first came with a cleansing of saying, God, I want you to hear me. And since you say that you will not hear me, if I have sin in my life, Lord, I confess my sin. And that's also very important because we, when we confess our sins, the Bible says that he is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, righteousness, to forgive us our sins. And so here it says that we have a covenant. But if we have sinned, and I know we have sinned, we have not done the right thing, Lord, forgive us, cleanse us from it. And so he says, my father's house and I have sinned. 
And why is he saying that? He's saying that it's our sin that brought us to where we are. Maybe I should give a background of this. Jerusalem had been over, uh, has been has been at war and the Assyrians and the Babylonians have captured the place. And they burnt down their walls. Walls are for what? Defense. So what did they do? They burnt and broke down the wall so that the people will be left defenseless. When they are left defenseless, what happens is that they have an uninterrupted access to them. This is the same principle that the devil does for us. That's it. And why did God allow Jerusalem, the city of the Lord, why did he allow you to be um, over, overtaken by enemies? The man said it here. It's because of our sins. So our sins can allow the devil to have an uninterrupted access to us because our defense has been broken down. Sin can break down the defenses of our lives. Sin, it can break down the defenses of our lives. And so this man identified that the reason why we are where we are is the reason is our sin. And so he asks God for forgiveness. And he knows that God will always forgive sin. He doesn't want us to sin, but he has made provision for forgiveness of sin for us. All right, let's go on. He says, we have acted very corruptly against you, and we have not kept your commandments. Simply saying, we have sinned. The statutes, not the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. But remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out in the farthest part of the heaven, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I've chosen as my dwelling for my name. Now, these are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by the strong hand. And now he started to tell the Lord that these people are your people, just like you and me. We are the redeemed of the Lord. God has redeemed us. Redemption simply means Jesus took the hand of God and he took anyone who has been redeemed, took our hand and joined our hands together. That's what he has done. Brought the hand of the Father, brought your hand, joined it together. So what we lost, we were redeemed back. We came back to him. So you could look at this prayer and say, you know what, you have redeemed us by your great power. At this time, he was of course talking about the children of Israel. He redeemed them from Egypt. He brought them out of Egypt. And so he's saying to them that, saying to the Lord that, Lord, you created this city of Jerusalem. You gave it to us where you redeemed us from Egypt. And so we know we have seen that's where we are, where we are. But we know that if we come back to you, you will bring everything back to us. And let's go on with that. Oh Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name and let your servant prosper this day, I pray. Grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Everybody say in the sight of this man. And then he said something, for I was the king cup bearer. Uh, my time is nearly up, but let me take about five more minutes. The guy who said this prayer, his name is Nehemiah. He was a slave in captivity in, when he started, he said, I was in Shushan. He was in the palace as a cupbearer. How could this man ever think that he will go and build the wall of Jerusalem that was down? The first thing started with a burden. The burden turned into a desire. The burden was that he didn't like what he saw. He didn't like what he had, sorry. And so he desired to make a change. The change, the desire turned into prayer because he knows that there is no way he who was in captivity and a slave to go back to Jerusalem and build the wall. It's like most of us who are in diaspora today. For me who is in diaspora now to think that I have this burden to rebuild my country, Nigeria. When I get there, who's going to listen to me? What authority do I want to say I have? I say, nobody knows me. 
But this is very important because he connected with God, who is an awesome God. So it doesn't matter where you are in life. Never count yourself out. He was a cup bearer. How can a cup bearer think that he will be able to do any significant thing? But when you are with God, nothing shall be impossible. So he identified first with God. He took it into prayer. He took it into fasting. It became a burden for him. He prayed, he says, I pray night and day. When time you see that, it means all the time. It means he prayed all of the time. He prayed ceaselessly without stopping. And we could look at the story and then we could see the hand of God. Let me say, I said two things. The first thing is desire. The second thing for a new beginning is what? I said vision. The desire is a product of a vision. Please listen to me as I go. Every time you have a burden for a change, that means a new beginning. It's one thing to have a burden. Let a lot of people have burdens. They feel burdened by different things. They feel concerned about a lot of things. But it ends in concern for many people. It never translates into a desire. How can desire come? Desire is also a product of vision. Because don't forget, I said the vision is what a preferred future. It's a preferred future. And so what normally happens is that all of a sudden, you, have, you see that things can be better than what it is. So the desire to do that comes upon you. And then you say, your prayer now is channeled towards doing that. Are you following me? I don't want to confuse you. He had the news. The news was a concern and a burden for him. And he knew that based upon that concern and that burden, he could make a change. But he can look at his own life and say, how can I make a change? I'm a cup bearer. I'm a servant. But then the desire was there, which is a product of what? A vision of these walls, instead of them being down, they can be rebuilt. So he had the vision of the walls of Jerusalem being rebuilt. You also must have a vision. Because if you don't have a vision, listen to me, please listen to me. If you don't have a vision, your burden is nothing, your concern is nothing. But if you have a vision, once you have that burden, <laughs> the desire to execute that vision comes upon you. Now you start to work on it. So you could have had this thing, and he could have said, yes, it's not right. You know, you are burdened, you're concerned, and then your concern fizzles out. I'm going to talk about this next week because a lot of people have concern and burden, but they fizzle out. That's not God's vision. God's vision and God's concern that he lays upon your heart, if it's the vision God wants you to carry out, it never fizzles. It's always burning in your heart. Nobody can talk you out of it. Time and season does not change it. And so we'll look at this man. He had the news. But most, for some of us, we're not just hearing the news. We see it. But we must never, never abandon what our vision that God has laid upon your heart. Then the man said something which I said we should all say together. He said, this man, in the sight of this man, his prayer became specific because now he has a vision of what he wants to do. His prayer changed and it became specific. His prayer what became specific. About what he saw and what he needed to get to where he's going. I want to challenge you this year. Don't be praying, God bless me, God bless me. I want you to pray, God, this is what I need. Be specific about what you need. The man became so because he knew the sight of this man that he was talking about was the king. He was a cup bearer before the king. And so he's asking God, give me favor before the king. Let me have favor before the king so that when I speak to him, he will listen to me. That's what each and every one of us have to do all the time. 
Be specific about what you want from God. He is your father. Speak to him and tell him, Lord, this is what I desire. This is what I want because of my vision of where I want to go. And so I need you, the great and awesome God, to help me to execute this vision. And let me tell you this. When you don't have a vision, life is not interesting. So you must have a vision. But it starts with the desire. It starts with the body. The body that turns into a desire. And a desire that turns into a vision of what you want it to be. And then you start to pursue it in every area of your life. For marriage, for health. You think about it. Career, whatever it is. You will find out that if you use this principle, it will not only help you once, it will help you always. Let's bow down our heads. I'm out of time. Heavenly Father, once again today, we thank you. We bless your name. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to execute the visions that you have laid upon us. Many people are seated here today, Lord. They're looking at their lives and they're depending upon you to help them to execute that vision for their career, for their marriages, for their health, for their businesses, for different things they want to do. They're looking up to you. My Father, my God, you are the great and the awesome God. Show your awesomeness in their lives. Meet them at the very point of their need. Help them, Heavenly Father. Because they can't help themselves. And but with you, Lord, we are in a covenant relationship through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we ask for forgiveness of our sins. We ask that, Lord, you will help us. That we will be that which you want us to be. We need you, Lord. Help us.